Hi there! In one of the previous episodes of this series, we have analyzed the chip ICL8038, which provides a very good solution for building a VCO around it. Unfortunately, I realized that finding this component on the market has become more and more difficult, and so that made me think that this component may be very well close to obsolescence. If that is true, I would be a fool to try to use it for my synth project. In view of these issues, I decided to start looking for other options, and I actually found one, which I will present to you today. Along with this presentation, I will also show you how to make a reference voltage for the audio circuitry of the synth. A reference voltage is useful for several reasons, but specifically, it will be needed for the new chip I will talk about today. So, let's take a look at this new chip, and then let's take a look at the schematic I designed for the reference voltage, and how we can build a prototype and test it in lab. Let's begin. Hi there! I am Carlo Carrano, and this is Electronics Engineering Made Easy. The chip we will talk about today is the SSI2130. At the time I made this video, I had already ordered one to experiment with, but I didn't receive it yet. However, to show you why I decided to give it a try, I will show you its datasheet, and we will go together through its most interesting and most important features. Then, we will start working at the reference voltage circuit. As you can see from the first page, the chip is produced by Sound Semiconductor, a company that specializes in audio chips, especially those for synthesizers. It is available in a 32-lead 4x4mm QFN package. A lot of pins in a very small space, and it is only available only as a surface mount component. For simplicity, I decided to buy one already mounted on a breakout board sold by Amplified Parts. It costs a few bucks more than the standalone chip, but it is still a very good deal so much that I am thinking of using also other components from the company for other modules of our synth project, like the VCA and the VCF. Back to the SSI2130, we can see from the block diagram that the chip provides several shapes of waves at the same time. We have a triangular wave output, a sawtooth output, which can actually provide either an actual sawtooth or a ramp, depending on the polarization of a control pin. And then we have a square wave and a pulse. If you look at the left of the block diagram, you will see a PWM control pin, and that is the one that controls the duty cycle of the pulse, so we can change it at will using a control voltage. The chip does not directly provide a sine wave output, but there is a sine shaper module inside of it. If you fit the sine shaper module with a triangular wave, the sine shaper will provide a very good sine wave to its output. The voltage control for the frequency of all these waves can be fed to either a linear input or an exponential input that can be easily calibrated to provide a 1 volt per octave control range, which is the standard for any commercial keyboard used in synthesizers. The exponential input allows us to easily go through the whole range of frequencies in a way that mimics the way our ears perceive the frequencies, making it easier to use also other kinds of control voltage sources, like a simple potentiometer or a tape resistor. Another interesting element of this chip is an audio mixer with 5 channels. It's a nice addition to the chip and allows us to do certain things with the synth that would not be possible otherwise without an external mixer module. Three of the audio channels are already connected to the mixer. It is the triangle output, the sawtooth output and the pulse output. And then there are two auxiliary channels that can be used for mixing additional signals, like the other ones generated inside the chip, or even external ones. On the next page, we can see the electrical specifications of the chip. Note that the chip needs an asymmetrical power supply. We need a plus 5 volts, and we need also a negative voltage that can go anywhere from minus 4.75 volts and minus 18 volts. Other interesting things in these specs are the frequency sweeper range of 1000 to 1. 
This is very large and should allow us to easily generate up to 10 octaves without changing the capacitor for the time constant. It's a very good feature, actually. From the specs for the exponential converter, we can deduce that the control signal is actually a current, not a voltage. But with the use of a resistor in series, we can easily do the conversion. And we will see that once I have the chance of playing with the device a little bit. It also looks like that we have two separate sync capabilities, the traditional one, which is the hard sync, and a sort of soft sync. I will have to run some experiments on that one to see if I can make it useful for the synth, otherwise I will just leave this capability out. Then we have the specs for the various signal outputs. It seems like that all of them can provide a signal up to 2.5 volts of amplitude, which is going to be all above the ground value, so it goes from 0 to 2.5 volts. Finally, some specs for the mixer, which can control each channel with a variable attenuation of up to 100 dBs. And here is the functional block diagram. And now there is this page with a list and explanation for all the pins. It will surely be useful for experimenting on the chip. We can see that there is the need for a reference voltage of exactly 2.5 volts on pin 23. I read elsewhere in this manual that it is used to provide a stable way to charge and discharge the timing capacitor, so basically the device will provide a stable output frequency that will be as stable as the reference voltage that we will provide to it. And here is the schematic for the typical application of the SSI2130. This will be the starting point for my experiments. I am quite sure I will have to modify something here and there in the schematic to obtain what we really need. But uh, more work for later, I guess. And now the data sheet goes on with detailed explanations of how different things can be done and how to modify the basic circuit to make that happen. But let's move on now. I think we have spent already enough time on this document. Time to do something more practical. Since we have seen on the datasheet that the chip needs a stable reference voltage of 2.5 volts, let's see how we can achieve that. Here is the schematic I came up with. I started by using the plus 12 volts stabilized power supply that we can extract from the power rails. Then I used a zener diode to reduce the voltage to a lower one, which is further lowered through the trim pot RP1. The reason for that is to achieve a good stability. A zener presents already a good stability if powered through a resistor with a stable voltage. However, any zener diode voltage tends to drift a little with the change of the ambient temperature and the temperature at its own junction. Using a zener with a higher voltage than the one we need, and then reducing it with a voltage divider, reduces also the drift of the same ratio of the divider. And so, I used a zener diode with a voltage of 10 volts, which I cleaned up with the capacitors C5 and C1. Then, I used RP1 to reduce the voltage to one quarter of it, the 2.5 volts we actually need. The reduced voltage is also cleaned with capacitor C2. In particular, capacitor C5 should help keep the voltage on the zener more stable when the current load changes. Capacitor C1 instead should short to the ground the junction noise generated by the zener itself. Capacitor C2, on this other side, helps cut down the noise even more after the voltage has been reduced to the required one. And so now we have a precise 2.5 volts at the ends of C2. But this voltage has a relatively high impedance. High enough to cause a slight variation of the voltage when a load is applied to extract the reference voltage. To eliminate the problem, I added a voltage follower made out of an UA741 op-amp. The 2.5 volts at the upper end of C2 is injected into the non-inverting input of the op-amp. The output of the op-amp is injected, as is, into the inverting input, creating a feedback loop that causes the output voltage to be exactly the same as the one at the non-inverting input. The output of the op-amp can provide a reference voltage with an internal impedance of almost zero, which will prevent changes of voltage with the changing of the load. If you want to know more about this op-amp configuration, you may want to take a look at my video on op-amps, for which the link is coming up on the upper right corner right now. 
Finally, to make the voltage even more stable, I added another capacitor, C6, to the output of the op-amp. This reference voltage circuit won't be a circuit on its own PCB. Instead, it will be integrated on the same PCB where it is needed, like the VCO for example. It would seem that we could have a reference voltage and make it available everywhere is needed, but we cannot really do that. We need to make it local to the circuit that needs it to reduce to a minimum any possible interference, as well as losses caused by the resistance of long connecting wires. Let's now take a look at the prototype I built. This is the op-amp used to adapt the impedance of the reference voltage, and here is the Zener diode that creates the higher reference voltage. This one instead is the trim pot that allows us to tune the exact voltage we want on the output of this circuit, and this trim pot of course is a multi-turn trim pot, so we can fine-tune the exact voltage we require. All around here you can also see the capacitors used for filtering and cleaning the output voltage of all the noise introduced by the semiconductors and by the resistors, as well as the electrolytic ones that provide support for the current spikes. The circuit is powered with a dual power supply of plus and minus 12 volts. Let's now turn on the voltmeter and let's measure the output voltage. This pin corresponds to the ground connection. Let's now use the red probe to verify that we are powering the circuit with an actual dual power supply. On this pin we should read plus 12 volts. Yeah, in fact the reading supports that. And this other pin is the one at the minus 12 volts, which actually seems to be, uh, well, much closer to 11. Apparently the power supply I'm using is not that good. At some point I must make a bench power supply of my own. I, I am tired, really tired of seeing wrong voltage values. Anyway, let's now connect the red probe to the actual output of the circuit. Well, right now the output is not the 2.5 volts we need, but of course we still need to tune the thing part. So let's do that now, and let's see how quickly we can obtain the voltage we need. Oh, oh, by the way, when we will build this circuit on the final PCB, we will wait a few minutes after the power up to let the circuit reach its thermal stability. Only then, we will start the tuning process. The circuit is already stable as is, the drift, like we will see, should not be greater than a few millivolts, well within the specs of the SSI2130. However, waiting a few minutes before doing the tuning will make things even better, I think. Ok, now we are almost at the 2.5 volts. Just a little more... Ah, ok, well now it's too much and we have to go back. You see, I'm now playing just on the third decimal digits, which is a very good precision for what we need. At this point we should wait a few minutes to make sure that the output voltage does not change. So I'll stop the recording for now, so I won't bother you with the wait, I'll be right back. Ok, we are back now. Oh, I waited 3 minutes and there has been no change at all in the output voltage, and, and that is a very good result. But at this point, I want to show you something very interesting. I'm going to use my screwdriver to force the cool down of the Zener diode. We should see a change in the voltage output, let's see how much is this change. Here, I'm putting the flat part of the screwdriver in contact with the body of the Zener diode, so it will absorb more heat. Uh, you can see that as soon as I do that, uh, the voltmeter starts uh, to go down immediately. But you can also see that after a drift of a few millivolts, the voltage is stable again, and it is now set just 5 millivolts below the previous value. Which is good, which means that there is a drift, but the drift does not keep going forever, but it stops after a while. It looks like the drift is really low also, exactly as we expected. And if we now consider that to have a control voltage rate of 1 volts per octave, we expect a change from one knot to the next of 1 12 of our volts, which is 83.3 uh, millivolts, a 5 millivolts drift in forced condition means that we would have an error of 6% on the frequency of a note in the worst case scenario. And considering a more visible drift of 1 millivolt in a real life application, we would have a frequency error of only about 
which our ear will probably not even appreciate. Before closing, I would like to show you the breakout board I just received with the SSI2130 on it. Yeah, it arrived at what I was shooting the video, yes. <laughs> you can see how small is the chip and so why I decided to buy the version on breakout board. Besides making it easier to solder it on the final VCO PCB, it will also make things easier for prototyping. You see, it shows you all the pin names, uh, so it's easier to decide what connections to make on a breadboard. All the 32 pins of the chip are ported on two lines, organized like a big dwelling line package that fits perfectly on the breadboard. I am just excited that I will soon start running experiments on this device. I really hope to find that this chip is exactly what I need for designing the VCO of the synthesizer we are building. And actually, if you have any suggestion on the kind of tests I could run, please let me know in the comments, I would really appreciate that. In the meantime, I'll see you in my next video and as usual, happy experiments!